Good afternoon and welcome to the first paper of the 2013 Large Herd Seminar. My name is Robin Hawkey, I'm the Senior Nutritionist at Moore Valley Feed Solutions. Now as um, Mike was saying, the theme of this year's conference is investing in the future. And I think all of us in the industry would very much appreciate that how much expansion is actually going on in the dairy industry at the moment. But with that expansion, it's not just, as Mike was saying, it's not just the extra sheds and the extra cows and the bigger parlour, but it's the increasing standards of management and husbandry that goes with it. I think you'd all agree that going from 100 to 200 to 400 cows just isn't getting doubling each time, is it? Is that it gets more and more difficult, so the standards have got to increase with, with, that, with that improving size. Now, very much widely accepted as very critical within a dairy system is dry cow management. And the first paper of this year's seminar is entitled Feeding the Dry Cow, and I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Gordy Jones. Gordy qualified as a vet in 1977 and practiced for 22 years, and is now an independent dairy performance consultant, but also a partner in a 4,000 cow unit, which I think Gordy will describe shortly. But claim to fame, Gordy also hosted Country Files' Adam Henson on his recent trip to America to investigate um, large herds. I'm sure many of you will have seen that at the time. But was also very much involved in the design of Nocturne Dairies, which also brought along a film, film crew from the Panorama programme. So I'm sure that was a bundle of laughs as well. <laughs> Gordon, on behalf of More Valley Feed Solutions, could I now invite you to present your paper, Feeding the Dry Cow. I want to thank you for inviting me. I want to thank Warwick and Richard for inviting me to come. And uh, I'm not going to stand behind the podium. I'm an American. I have to dodge. People shoot. So I'll have to keep moving to not be in one spot. Uh, I did find out the definition. And we're both, we both speak the same language. And we are uh, two nations separated by a common language. Uh, but I found out the definition of irony as I walked a dairy yesterday. I had someone with the last name Bastard impugn somebody building a dairy with the last name Crook. So as he looked at the man named Crook, he was wondering, how could a man named Crook build a dairy? How could you trust him? And I said, this irony comes from a man named Bastard. <laughs> and I just stood there having trouble with that. Uh, so sorry, Warwick, at your expense, but uh, it was irony at its best. So we'll talk a little bit about my dairy. We'll talk a little bit about cows. We'll talk a little bit about feeding cows. And we'll talk nothing about science. You've listened to two scientific papers already today, and I won't bore you with most. Uh, the, the, the slide from the enzyme that showed that, that sled dog out ahead, I live in a philosophy that if you're not the lead dog on a sled dog team, the view is the same. <laughs> so, so I try to lead, as, lead rather than follow, simply to have the best view that I can have. So we'll talk about dry cows. I've been feeding dry cows as a veterinarian. Uh, I remember it was Richard Whiskey, and we used to call him Richard Whiskey. Richard Whiskey's herd uh, with 40 cows had two DAs that day as a young veterinarian. And when I got to see his two twisted stomachs, uh, Richard looked at me and said, uh, Doc Jones, how many of these have you done? And I said, counting these two? And I said, that would be two. <laughs> and Richard said, well, I sure hope God likes that cow. And I said, well, I hope God's smiling on me right now, too. But I was excited as a young vet that Richard got two DAs in a 40 cow dairy. I was very excited. And in fact, I was probably dancing knowing I could send my children to college and that I wanted Richard to have many more of these disasters. <laughs> and Richard asked me, he said, stop being so damn happy, Gordy. And he said, your job from this point on is to stop these. And I took that as, uh, as an oath with him, and we'll talk about that. So let's talk a little bit about where we're at. Central Sands Dairy, I was the managing partner for five years. Uh, my wife's not in the back, but some friends are, and they will tell you that I have an attention span of five years. After that, I have to go on to something new, otherwise I start hurting people. Um, and in the U.S., we have guns, so I could really hurt people. <laughs> so I've been at Fair Oaks, or Central Sands Dairy. I designed the Fair Oaks Complex. The Fair Oaks Complex right now has about 60,000 to, I think, 70,000 milk cows. I was the designer and then the implement of the feeding ration I'll talk about at their dairy. 
Uh, I helped design the visitor center today at Fair Oaks, Indiana that now hosts half a million people every year from Chicago to Indianapolis to across the world. I hate going in the visitor center anymore because as I step in there, somebody goes, hi, Gordy, and I don't know where they're going to be from. They're out of context. They could be anywhere in the world visiting that dairy complex. And uh, so we've opened it, the world to it. Because of Nocton, I opened the world to every humane organization in the Europe. I had uh, Philip Emery with World Compassion and Daring. I had the WISPA ladies from World Society of Protection. I had Adam. Adam was one of only two people in the world I ever threatened with bodily harm. I, I left Adam at my dairy. I trusted Adam so much that he said uh, cow comfort was size neutral, 4,000 cows on my dairy. I had to leave. Adam was there on a Sunday. He had taken many pictures. He said, can I stay and take pictures? I looked at Adam and I said, you can take pictures, but I will tell you this. I was on a Green Beret team for the U.S. military, and if you take a picture that's not representative of what you've seen for the last four hours, I will hunt you down and hurt you. <laughs> Adam spoke nicely of my dairy, uh, so with threats. So Central Sands, let's go on. Uh, I'm in the middle of the state of Wisconsin. It is the only place in the state. There are 1.2 million dairy cows in Wisconsin, and in that yellow circle is the only place without dairy cows. We put our cows in the middle. It's 50 miles by 100 miles. It's pure yellow sand. I don't have any other pictures. I'll have some tomorrow. But uh, that's the center. I used to say if Wisconsin was going to get an enema, it might be right there. Uh, there was, you had to drive an hour and a half across that piece of property and uh, to get to the rest of the cows. They're either north of it, they're west of it, they're east of it. Today I live, I moved off the dairy and I live in the second star up by the city of Green Bay. Let's get out of this. Our dairy cow, the reason we're all in this room is because of her. She belongs to a group of animals called Pleistocene megafauna. Really big animal from the Ice Age, that's all it means. Giant rhinoceros, hairy mammoths, uh, woolly mammoths, all of those animals, the giant bear, the giant sloth, were all Ice Age animals. This is our animal. She was born during the last Ice Age. If you invite a cow tonight into your hotel room and you let her set the thermostat, her favorite temperature is four degrees Celsius. Never forget that. Your favorite temperature is 18 to 20. Don't forget what she is. So the very first farmers were about 5,000 years ago. They were in Mesopotamia. We call that today Iraq. They were found the large-headed grains. Humankind had walked past grass for thousands of years, and suddenly those large-headed grass seeds became the carbohydrates that started agriculture. We took a stick in the sand. That's wheat, barley, triticale, rye, oats. We took a stick in the sand. We dragged that in the sand of Iraq, Mesopotamia. We made a furrow. We put a little water on it. Come. Let's put water. Whoops. We put a little water on it and suddenly we were farmers. That's how agriculture started about 5,000 years ago. And in fact, when it started, we had to build the first fences. So the very first fences that were ever built were built... Holy cow, is that going fast. They were built to keep the... Wa He's making signals down here going... <laughs> giving me tens. The very first fences we ever built were to keep the wild cows out. The wild cow opened the gate. She let herself in, just like today. I have slides at home of where it takes two men and a boy to close the gate on heifers, and they can get out in three minutes after you left them. <laughs> so she opened the gate, she let herself in, and suddenly we had a cow. That's how we domesticated the cow. We captured the cow. She was inside our pen, and she made a covenant with us. We'll talk about that covenant in a second. Only 11 species have we domesticated successfully. All of those species, the cow is the star. She is the foster mother of the human race. She provided power, protein, and fertilizer. As we tried to come out of Mesopotamia, if you went vertically on the planet, our plants and animals don't work. As you go into Egypt and further south, 
the planet kills our plants and our animals. As you go laterally into Europe or Asia, it works really well. So she's the foundation of civilization. The reason you in this room, the reason Europe controlled the world, were accidents of domestication of our plants and animals. And the cow is the absolute star of that domestication. Without her, we don't have civilization. She's the foster mother of the human race. And I'm going to give you a homework assignment. Of all the domesticated species that we've domesticated, they're all herd species. They look to a leader. You're the leader. They look, whether it's the horse, the chicken, the pig, the cow. Every one of our domesticated species looks to a leader except the cat. I'm not sure we've domesticated the cat. <laughs> if, you, if, if you die in your house with a cat, it will eat you. <laughs> when you go to the refrigerator and feed your dog, it looks up at you and goes, you're a god and you feed me. If you feed the cat from the refrigerator, it looks up at you and goes, I'm a god and they feed me. <laughs> Dogs have owners, cats have staff. <laughs> okay, so we have a covenant to care for and keep this animal. All of you in the room, whether you're a nutritionist, whether you work for industry, whether you're a dairyman, our covenant is to keep and care for this cow because she's allowed civilization to happen. And I can't start some talks until you've heard this from me. She's the absolute star of the show, and our covenant is to, to stand for her, keep her, and keep her going well. Uh, this is one of the little cows at my place. I milk jerseys. Uh, I'm hoping Greg Bethard will talk a little bit about jerseys. In the U.S., it believes you milk jerseys because you're too poor to milk Holsteins and too proud to milk goats. <laughs> um, so I milk little yellow cows, and uh, she is everything. Guns, Germs, and Steel. This is your homework assignment. It's a 400, 600, 800 page book. It's the story of civilization. It's the story of our domestication. It's the story I just gave you in four slides. Uh, Jared Diamond did an amazing piece of work here. And if you can't get through the first 300 pages, number one, you don't like cows. Number two, there is a video. There's a four hour video that does a wonderful job. Don't read the book. But Gun, Germs, and Steel is your homework for today. Vaccine, when we first developed vaccine, the very first vaccine we ever developed was for against smallpox. We as humans have killed more other humans with smallpox than all the wars combined. And the cow stepped up and protected us. In fact, she gave us cowpox. Those of us that are my age have a mark on our shoulder where they took a glass rod, broke it, dipped it in the virus of cowpox, broke the skin on my shoulder, and I have a scar on my shoulder that's called the mark of the cow. Uh, all of us have been marked by the cow because she's protected Europe from smallpox. She's given us our first vaccine. The Latin word, the Spanish word, the Italian word for cow is vaca. That's the root word of vaccinine. You don't vaccinate, you cowinate. You don't give cow, you give cow seed to your children. Uh, she is everything to us. So I started my practice life on little farms like this. This is Don Risky's place, little 40 cow dairies. I've expanded to Fair Oaks. This is one of the Fair Oaks dairies of 60,000 milking cows. Uh, Western dairies. I've been fortunate enough to talk all around the world. I've been on every continent that has cows, except Antarctica, and we haven't been able to graze down there yet, so we don't have cows there. As a veterinarian, I thought that I would make a living putting my hand up cows' butts. That, that in Wisconsin, there was almost two million cows when I got there in 1977, and I thought if I could get my hand up the butt of every cow, I could make a great living, and I could save the dairymen. Veterinarians end up working in reproduction, milk quality, young stock, sick cows, and perhaps their interest, uh, ET, something else, something like that. And I was confined to the right side of that line. Early on in my life, I realized that if I didn't take care of the nutrition of the cow, the comfort of the cow, and dry cow facilities, dry cow rations, if I didn't take care of those three things, nothing on the right worked. As soon as I take care of the cow comfort, the nutrition, and the dry cows, then repro gets better, milk quality, the somatic cell count drops, the number of cases of mastitis go down, young stock are healthier, and in fact, sick cows go away. So the key to being a good veterinarian today in North America 
a key to being a good veterinarian across the world is to know these three things on this side of the line. And right now we're only going to talk about dry cows. Tomorrow we'll talk about expanding a herd, a little bit more about feeding it, and a lot more about how you take care of cows. Because that's the secret to everything. The dry cow program, it's a new way to look at an old problem. It's a new thing. In the United States, there's been a failure of the transition period. I think Dr. Grummer did a great job of telling you the science of the fresh cow, the science of the transition cow, but there's been a failure. There's been such a failure that at every veterinary meeting I go to, we end up listing what we're going to do to those cows. So in dry fresh cow programs, we're either going to do a close-up program, steam up rations, close-up rations, we'll do something to those, we'll steam them up, we'll do a 10-day program after they freshen. I used to pu publish a little note to my dairyman about the village downstream. That village downstream never remembered when the first body showed up in the river, but they started to see them, so they built a lookout tower. Then they manned the lookout tower day and night with lights, and they got rowboats, and they built a first aid tent, and they were getting prouder and prouder of the number of people they pulled out of the river and saved. That first aid station became a hospital. They manned that and trained the boat people day and night, but nobody in that village asked what was happening upstream. Somebody went upstream, put up a guardrail, and a hospital went out of business. <laughs> and so I ask my dairymen every time, are you working upstream or downstream? And watching these dry cow, fresh cow programs, these 10 day programs of doing things for cows for 10 days is simply more work downstream. Uh, we talk about drenching programs. I've got enough veterinarians in here that I can get out my notepad from Elanco. I can now start to ask you what you drench your cow with. And I will find 15 to 20 drenching formulas in this room because you all drench a fresh cow with something new, a little propylene glycol, a little choline, a little niacin, a little something else. It'll be in there with some alfalfa juice and away you go. Uh, some dairies will make fistulated cows so we can make a drench out of that. Some people have started to say, let's have short dry cow periods. Let's have no dry cow periods. Damn the dry cow periods killing them. <laughs> let's make them milk all the way through. That'll teach them. I, we've got people suggesting that. I've got people multiple milking. I've got people milking one time, two times, four times, six times, uh, you know, never letting her be a cow and sleep. So we have multiple milkings, uh, single milkings. Everybody's trying to fix the problem after the problem's ca been caused. So fresh cow, dry cows, close up, steam ups, 10 day, what, I got the same slide. Multiple milkings, once a day milkings. Now that I have a dairy, I have to ask myself what rules still apply. I threw in a couple slides to remind myself. I have given advice for 25 to 35 years to dairymen. And uh, when I got my own dairy, I had to ask, whose advice am I going to listen to? Uh, so what rules still apply? Nutrition, the dry cow program, and cow comfort. These are the foundation of what we do. The reproduction, nobody, if you're a cow on my dairy and you fail to get pregnant, we offer counseling. <laughs> because you're going to have a career change. <laughs> We're going to offer you something in agribusiness somewhere else, usually fast food. <laughs> so everybody has to get pregnant to keep them, and people get everything done. If my cows have a problem on my dairy, it has a first and last name. Gordy Jones, Carlos Sanchez, Peter Jones, my feeder, Somebody caused the cow's problems. Cows don't have problems. Rules that still apply. Cow comfort is first. Uh, you listen to great enzyme talk on forage. Forage is king, and the better forage is best. I just talked to a dairyman today that you guys went through hell. We sent you all our rain from the, use, the state last year. We had a drought, and you had all the water. Uh, so you didn't make forage, and we didn't make forage. Our forage was better than yours because we had sunshine. We just didn't have much of it. Uh, yours was terrible because you couldn't harvest it and there were no carbohydrates in it. Uh, forage is better. I just talked to somebody and he said he's at, he hit the next starch level. He's above 30 in his corn silage. He's put in first crop. He's taken out concentrates and milk's going up. It's magic. It's fun stuff. Better forage is better. Pregnancy rate means you keep your cows. The dry cow program stops early fresh cow losses. It's a matter of too little or too much, or how do we get it right? 
That's why this diet was called Goldilocks by Jim Drakely. So too much, too much body condition, too fat, too much weight loss, too much time in the dry cow pen. We'll talk about cows. In the United States, if you spend 120 days in the dry cow pen, four months, it's a death sentence. Uh, maybe not here in England. Too much energy, too many lactations, too many calves, triplets, canes, too much grain, too much overcrowding, perhaps too much nitrogen, or too little, too skinny, too much weight gain, uh, too much time in the dry cow pen, not enough time in the dry cow pen, too little selenium, too little energy, not enough dry matter intake, fiber, protein. So too little. We did all these. Body condition, weight loss, time, too little dry cow, small, short dry cow periods, selenium, cow comfort, fiber, too little space at the bunk. Let's go with that. So let's go, we'll go two seconds on the ration uh, that we feed cows, because I just want to get that. Rations that work best for me always are more than 50% forage. Currently on our dairy, we're feeding a 63% forage, 64% forage. I have a 28% NDFF. So 28% of my night NDF is coming from forage. Uh, more than, I feed no more than six to eight pounds dry matter from feeds with a 40% NDF that are not forage. The bacteria that live in the rumen of the cows we play with don't know that you're feeding corn silage, haylage, whatever. They live at a chemical level. And they live, the NDF, whether it comes from effective fiber or from byproducts, uh, gluten and distillers and that. So I have a rule that I never give more than six or eight pounds, three kilos, three and a half kilos of feeds with a 40% NDF that are byproducts. Butter fats have to be above three, five, three, seven. My jerseys have to hit five, no, no lower than four, six. Rumensin, I'm thrilled about this. I give 400, I'm thrilled that you can now do something I've illegally done for 25 years. Uh, I was thrilled when uh, the U.S. made it legal. I could stop calling it vitamin R and we could feed it legally. Uh, so you found out not only am I an American, I'm a crook. Uh, I feed so that the lowest intake cow has the release of that bolus. That bolus is giving out about 315 to 320 grams, 26 grams a day in a 100 day period. And I'm making sure the lowest intake cow I play with gets that dose. That's the dose that prevents problems. So why we don't feed to an empty bunk or just in time? This is a, a time representation of what you put in the bunk, you get there in the morning and you add feed. There are people in the U.S. that want to have an empty feed bunk. This is an empty feed bunk, but just in time they're delivering feed here. This little, when I, at my age when I hold a, when I hold a pointer, it looks like Tinkerbell on drugs. <laughs> so I can't point. So this is where we're trying to feed to just an empty bunk and then put more feed in. Tomorrow I'll present some of Alex Bach's stuff. Alex Bach, sent a, Alex Bach, who you had here last year, spent a summer in my practice understanding how we feed cows. So what does it look like the way we feed? We feed 100% or 80-20, and we deliver food when a cow wants it most. She wants it at dawn and dusk. We deliver feed to a bunk as a cow comes out of a parlor. For you nutritionists, the single largest error is not methionine, lysine balancing. The single biggest area dairy one makes is to not have more than 50% of the average income in front of the cow in the morning on exit from parlor. I can make more milk with that one simple step. This is how we feed at our dairy. Uh, that's it. Across the United States, there's been a failure of the transition period. We talked about this. Get you out of here on time. Uh, whether she has one calf, two calves, or four calves, we can keep her healthy. I do nothing on my dairy for cows that have twins. Dry cow program, it's about comfort, it's about low energy, high fiber, it's about Jim Drakeley's work. I've been feeding, nobody cared about what I was doing with this dry cow program when I was feeding 40 to 100 cow herds in northeast Wisconsin. Nobody cared up there. When I moved to Fair Oaks and I started to do it on 40,000 cows, and we were starting to have 4,000 cows on multiple dairies freshen, somebody, somebody started to care. 
Jim Drakely walked over to my dairy and, and looked at our numbers and said, Gordy, I'm going to show you why this works. And so Jim's been chasing it. Dr. Drakely's been chasing it ever since. And uh, his, his work will be the science of what I'm playing with. Displaced abomasums. The U.S. dairy industry, most dairy's goal is to be at 2%, 4%. Some people even have a goal to be at 6%. So that means that every 100 calvings we want four DAs or less. Achievable is a rate where we get less than 1%. So that of every 100 calvings, you can have one DA. If you make a mistake in 100 cow dairy, you're only going to see 120 freshenings a year. To hold a 100 cow dairy farm to one DA a year, and knowing what happens to you in February, March, and April, uh, is quite an accomplishment. And that's what we can do if we feed cows the way we want. This is one of the Fair Oaks dairies. It had 11 DAs in the total year for 3,000, oops, 3,059 calvings. If you look at any given month, there might have been, I'll look over here, there's 357 calvings and they had no DAs. So you can, or one DA. So we can get one-third of 1%. One At Central Sands with my little brown goats, with my jerseys, we had 4,200 calvings the last year I was there for a full year with four DAs. One in January, two in June, and one in December. 4,200 calvings, four DAs, no ketosis, RPs amazingly low, and cows who take off. This is a, a scatter graph of a 4,000 cow dairy at Fair Oaks before we implemented the dry cow program. So what this is, the cow in the circle is a heifer. She is 300 days in milk, and this was her first milk level. So what you're looking at is month by month by month first milk test on all cows. That's about 4,000 cows. If you look closely, something happened. Watch that line, and then this line. Something happened in the last 60 days, the last two months. This was a normal two-group, two-TMR ration. This was uh, a normal far-off ration and then a steam-up, where we were steaming up cows trying to do that. And that's how high first milk got. This is the implementation of the little bit we'll talk about going forward, and this whole graph, the cows at the bottom moved up and the cows at the top moved up. Today, uh, Dr. Grummer presented some of, in fact, at some of Drakely's individual cow work where he says he lost nine liters of milk on fresh cows. Losing nine liters is 20 pounds. I can't get rid of 20 pounds in a herd if I do everything wrong. I can't knock it down that low. This is a herd, a 4,000 cow herd, where we implemented the, the Goldilocks diet and first milks took off. The whole herd moved up, and we moved up way more than nine pounds. The common criticism across the U.S., I have to see a lot more science, is that you will have poor first milks. It is not our experience in over 100,000 cows within the Fair Oaks system. I've got dairies in Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, plus mine that do it. Our first milks have no problem, and we'll show you why coming up. So I want at least a six week dry cow period. If I have shorter dry cow periods, I lose profitability. So you need to give, make sure that the average cow never freshens with less than four 40 days in my dry cow pen. So I do 60 days on all of our dairies. I'm very traditional. We do one group TMR now for the dry cows. We do two at Fair Oaks. I can't get Fair Oaks to change on about 20,000 of their cows. They have a, a, a classic far-off ration, and they have a close-up that has the same NEL, but it has anionic salts in it. So the same energy, but they have a two-group system. I move my cows to a close-up pen. I have jerseys that supposedly get milk fever. And what I did was when I started my herd six years ago, I asked my jerseys, I said, you're all teenage brides. They were all heifers. And I said, nobody here is going to get milk fever, so I'm going to feed you one dry cow ration. When you tell me you get milk fever and you're the breed of choice for milk fever, when you get it, I'm going to change the ration. So please raise your claw and tell me you've got milk fever or lay down and not get up, uh, depending upon how you judge it. Uh, we're six years into the program. We've got multiple thousands of mature cows with many lactations now and we're still on a single dry cow ration with no anionic salts. 
uh, we're just not seeing anybody have any problems. So I'm feeding a single dry cow ration. I do move the cows. They're five weeks in one facility. I move them to the other facility. They spend three weeks in a close-up pen with the same ration. So I feed a wet ration and a dry ration at our dairy. You're either on the milk cow single ration or you're on the dry cow single ration. So it's all about getting intake. Dry matter intake on ration changes from the dry cow ration. I'm going to stick in pounds. You guys can understand pounds. If a cow eats 50 pounds of dry matter of a very high group ration, she'll get 40 megacals, 40 megacals of energy. If that cow is a 24% NDF from 4-H, at 50 pounds of dry matter, she will get a 12-pound rumen. At 26%, where I'm at right now, she'll get a 13 pounds of NDF in her rumen. Her rumen has 13 pounds of fiber in it from 4-H. If I feed a far-off dry cow ration, and it has a single dry cow ration, and it has a 50% NDF, and it's almost 100% forage, if I get a 24-pound intake, this is Jersey numbers, sort of, if I get a 24-pound dry matter intake, I will have, at 50%, I will have 12 pounds of NDF. So, I will have at 24 pounds of dry matter, with 12 pounds of NDF, I will have 24 times 60 NEL, and I'll put 14 and a half megacals of energy into the cow. When I was calling this the low energy, high fiber dry cow diet, Jim Drakeley yelled at me a lot. He said, Gordy, it's not low energy. NRC wants 14 and a half. He said, so even, I told you this is Jersey numbers, even on a Holstein, you're meeting NRC requirements with just 24 pounds of intake and a 50% NDF. My average Holstein eats about 26 to 30 pounds of dry matter. And so at 30 pounds, 15, she's putting in about, at 30 pounds, at 50%, she's putting in about 15 pounds of NDF and she's putting in 18 megacals. So dry matter intake with low energy and high fiber, far off rations, my Holsteins are eating 28 to 32, so about 12 and a half to 14 and a half kilos. These are Holstein numbers. The close-up cows are eating at Fair Oaks with the anionic salts, they drop a pound or two. So they're still getting uh, 11 and a half kilos of dry matter. The far-off cows at 60 megacals, 0.6 megacals, they're getting 18. Remember, the NRC needs 15, 14 and a half. So I'm getting plenty of energy into my cows. They don't lose weight. And the close-up cows, when I did a close-up at dairy at Fair Oaks, it was getting 62 megacals. Today, most of my rations for Holsteins run 0.58 to 60. We'll talk about that as we go on. So I'm getting 16 and a half megacals into a close-up cow. I have trained cows not only to get the energy they need, but to fill up a full rumen and to know how to eat. And one of the fun things that happens with that is I feed no more than eight pounds dry matter 3.5, 3.6 kilos of corn silage. I feed four to six pounds of dry straw, high quality, low energy, and it must be chopped short. Straw wasn't necessary for this ration to work. Some of you nutritionists have dairymen last year that cut first crop because of your rain a month late. That stuff works in the dry cow program. Its energy is so low, it doesn't have to be straw. The reason I went to straw, in my small diet, small dairy herds, I did not need straw. The reason I didn't need straw was they would take too long to cut first crop. I had low energy feeds. I had traditional dairymen. And so I could find a feed under 0.6 NEL. Today on a modern dairy, I can't, corn silage is at 0.65 to 70. My Hay leach is at 0.65. Every number I have is above 6.5, and I can't do algebra to get it down to 6.0. Because I can't do the algebra, I added straw. In fact, I made a, 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 an admission to, on a, nine, on, a, on a 42, 44 liter per cow dairy, almost 15 years ago, 
I couldn't find any energy on his feed other than the bedding he was using, and the bedding was sawdust. I added more than four pounds of sawdust to his dry cow ration to lower the energy. And I did that out of desperation for the guy. We solved his metabolic fresh cow problems, and then I talked him into straw. I, I said, we can't tell the world we're feeding sawdust. We will go to jail. Uh, so lower the energy, and we lower it with straw. So that's, this is just a guideline. Uh, two to three kilos of grain. Half of that grain is coming out of this eight pounds dry matter, three and a half kilos of corn silage. I feed two kilos of corn silage dry matter, and I'm feeding just under two kilos of milk cow push-out. The milk cow push-out is going to have the same net energy as corn silage, so I'm in that eight pounds, three and a half kilo dry matter of corn silage. But on my dairy, I have nobody else to feed the extra milk cow feed to, so it is a dry cow ingredient. And because it's a little bit, it's been drizzled on, drooled on, spit on, and pushed around by my jerseys, it's probably at about 0 0.68, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 NEL. It's like corn silage, so it fits in my rules. No more than a half pound, half a kilo is added to the ration of concentrates. I add no starch to my dry cow diet. My typical dry diet has no corn, no maize, no barley, no wheat going into my dry cows. I add no phosphorus to any cow on my dairy. So no milk cow, no dry cow gets phosphorus. I don't pay for it from the mill. I only use limestone. And uh, no dye cows or anything else. We add uh, no grain. My NFC on my rations are below 27. We'll have those in here in a minute. And then the single biggest guide to that is if you're in charge of this ration, the cow can't mix it up. There is a lot of really great work at, at UW, Wisconsin, that says every dry cow needs 30 inches of bunk space. And the more you mess up a dry cow ration, the more critical it is that they all eat the same messed up dry cow ration. As you reduce bunk space, we were on a dairy yesterday that had about 12 inches of bunk space for dry cow. He had a three row facility behind it, was feeding this Goldilocks diet, and somebody asked about bunk space. Bunk space is not as critical as if the first cow and the last cow are eating the same identical diet. As soon as there's sorting that happens, somebody's getting a different ration. And surprisingly, it's not the one who sorted first and got all the goodies that falls apart. Uh, she's the one who falls apart. We think it's always the one who got the crap at the end. The one who got the crap at the end just ate more crap. And she does fine because she was low in energy on that diet. She just ate more of it and she does fine. So when it fails, if you try and feed the Goldilocks diet practically, if it fails for you, it failed because it sorted and the cow got energy. If the cow gets energy, what I need you to do is lower the energy. And all of you will go up in energy because this is no man's land where you're playing. And when, you, when it doesn't work, you'll back off. So it prevents sorting and do this. So this is a scatter graph of days dry along the bottom of the graph. These are all the cows at Central Sands. And this is the first milk compared to days dry. The first cows that are under 40 days don't have any milk up above this blue line. Now we're only going to look at the cows past 60 days dry, but this is a profile of a whole herd. So when you take it to a whole herd and you're looking after 70 days, these cows had 70 days in the dry cow period. These cows did six months in my dry cow period. When I filled Central Sands, I had cows that spent nine months. I think I had a cow who got pregnant in my dry cow pen. <laughs> I was buying some dairy herds, and when you buy a dairy herd in the United States, I was buying 200, 400 cow dairy herds. When you buy those herds, you put them on a bus, you give every one of them a bus ticket, they rode the bus for six to eight to 12 hours to get to my dairy. If you are four months away from having a calf, you're in the last four months of uh, your gestation, you are, after a 12 hour bus ride, you are going to dry up. So you got off, my, off the bus, we tried to make you milk, we made you ride the merry-go-round at my place, I have a 72 cow rotary, we made you ride the merry-go-round for four times so that you would understand what the process is around here. This is where we put cows, you walk on the parlor, you did, and then we threw them in the dry cow pen. 
And I had cows that were in there 10 months. I had cows that were in there uh, 10 months, and they got pregnant in there, I'm sure. I had to. I had an old bull. I threw my bulls in there early when cows cost 2500 I had bulls roaming the pregnant pens of my dairy. I gave them a job, and they became dedicated to their job. Every one of them would look for a cow that was open. They gave me a report every morning that they found somebody, you know, and they were thrilled, and I got to save a cow. But I had to rest them on the dry cow diet. So I got a couple cows pregnant in my dry cow pen. It's embarrassing. I don't want to talk about it. But here's a cow spending eight months, 108, six months, in the dry cow pen. Look at the R squared value. The R squared, this is the only science you'll get from Gordy Jones. The R squared value is zero, zero. There is no relationship to the time in the dry cow pen on the Goldilocks diet. Time in the dry cow pen to first milk. You can spend five months in there, and it's not a death sentence. The average dairyman I had, used to have, that would put a cow in the dry cow pen for more than 100 days, it was a ketotic, fatty liver death sentence, at least in my hands, and she would fall apart. So what this is, is living proof for you, it doesn't matter how many days you spend. If this cow is below our average line, she's below the average line because her relative value is below. If she's above, way up here, she's above because she's a superior cow. The belt curve of these cows are simply the spread of my good heifers I bought and my bad heifers I bought, or my dry cows that I ended up with in the herd. So this is first projection by days dry for days dry, 70 to 180. R squared values that. So too much, too much body condition, too much weight gain in the dry cow pen, too much time in that pen. Time doesn't matter on the Goldilocks. These are where dairies fall apart. This is what they think they fall apart with. So it's too much energy, tears them apart. Let the cow decide her energy. Give her ad lib and let her eat it. I'm getting the five minute single, we'll go past this. Displaced abomasums. U.S. dairy industry, four to six percent, less than one percent is achievable. 3,200 calvings, uh, 15 DAs. This is 3,215, that's a 0.4, that's a half a percent. This was somebody we'd gotten into that did that. Dry matter intake changes. I want to talk about this for a quick second. At 50 pounds of dry matter, at a 26 NDF, my milk cows are eating 13 pounds of fiber. My far-offs, let's do my far-off dry cows. At 26 pounds of dry matter, at a 50% NDF, I have trained a Holstein to eat 13 to 14 pounds of NDF. The day she freshens, she moves over to my milk cow ration, and to get that same rumen fill that I've taught her to fill, she ends up wanting to eat 13 pounds of NDF. My ration needs 50 pounds to deliver that. We have a, at Newberry Dairy, he has an 18 day in milk dry cow, fresh cow pen. Mature cows, 18 days in milk average, his average intake is 52 pounds. Average intake at 18 days in milk at 52 pounds gets you out of any milk drop you'll see in early fresh cows. I have trained my fresh cows to eat because I've trained them to fill their rumen up. Our graph of our, we don't do single dry cow intake, so I can't tell you how it happens. My three week period has the same intake as my five week far off dry cows. And when I put my cow in the fresh pen to freshen, the minute she has her calf and licks it up, she goes immediately to a 200 relative value bale of hay and chews that down. She wants to refill. She hasn't eaten for that little period of time while she's calving and while she was in stage one and two labor, but that's it. So the magic is my close up ration, my far off ration ends up with the same intake of NDF pre fresh and post fresh. Uh, I'm running out of time. So far off cows eat 28, close up cows eat 26 to 29. Uh, the far off cows are getting all the energy they need. This is the same data we put. What's the specifications look like? This is the only important line. 0.58 to 6.2 in my system of NEL. And if it has to be lower than that, lower it. Just stop the sorting. And we're gonna get here on time. These are in there, they're published for you. I want to show this. You've got this. 
First of all, back to this, it looks like I'm also thinking Elenco. I want rumensin in every one of my rations and I want my lowest intake cow to eat that much. I can help my rations with rumensin. I end up helping ketosis with it. I end up also helping uh, in the US. If you have that intake, the Canadian data shows you have no yonis. England, we're not allowed to talk about it. US, we're not allowed to talk about it. But Duffield's work in the, in Duffield's work, Duffield, I'm allowed to talk about it. Duffield's work in Canada got it on the label. In Canada, rumensin is part of a Yoni's control program. It reduces shedding. So this is the magic ingredient, this roto grinder. It cost 18,000 pounds here in the British Isles. It cost about $16,000 in the US. That's the entry club if you have 2,000 cows or more. Or talk your neighbor into it and lease it for three hours a month. Uh, make that thing, make the feed as short as a cow's mouth is wide. So the feed has to be no bigger than a small cell phone. If it's not this, then the cows are sorting it and you have cows on different dry cow rations. You have to have cows on one dry cow ration, the one that you've made. So dry cow management is the single most important phase of production. Three things a cow should do, we'll talk about these tomorrow. She should stand to eat and drink, stand to milk, and all the rest of the time she ought to be laying down, chewing her cud, and asking herself the important questions of the world. So that's it. We'll uh, have questions at the end. I got out here just on time. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions during the panel, and I'm happy to meet with you guys afterwards tonight over the fourth beer. <laughs> uh, I need that to tell you. Thank you. I just want to thank you for a very interesting talk.